Hello, I'm Robert Purchase, an orthopedic surgeon here in San Francisco, California with a specialty in shoulder surgery and sports medicine. My plan is to explain the nature of and treatment of a very common but often vexing cause of shoulder pain, adhesive capsulitis. Thank you for your interest in this topic and I hope that you find this quick 10 minute video informative. Adhesive capsulitis is also known as frozen shoulder. It is a painful, gradual loss of range of motion of the ball and socket shoulder joint resulting from chronic inflammation of the shoulder capsule. Now every joint has a capsule which is a thin layer of soft tissue that separates the joint space from the, out, from the rest of the body. This inflammation causes progressive fibrosis of the capsule and adherence of the capsule to itself and to the humerus. This causes shortening of the ligaments that are embedded within the capsule causing decreased range of motion or stiffness. Patients with adhesive capsulitis complain of pain, and this pain can be severe. Often it is described as achy all the time or at rest, and any attempt to move the arm causes sharp pain. It often hurts more at night. Additionally, patients will note stiffness. Sometimes it feels as if the shoulder is frozen to their side. Now, if the sti stiffness is less severe or left less obvious, you may just notice difficulty with activities that require a fair amount of shoulder motion, such as combing your hair, feeding belt through your butt pants, hooking your bra, buckling a seat belt, that sort of thing. Now these symptoms are easily understood when you keep in mind the pathologic process. The inflammation causes the achy pain and the shortening of the ligaments accounts for the limited range of motion. That severe sharp stabbing pain with motion, that's because the motion causes tension or pulling on that inflamed tissue. Now if you have not yet seen an orthopedic surgeon about your shoulder, you can expect the doctor to spend some time with you discussing your complaints. This helps the doctor to fully understand the nature of your problem, how you experience the problem, and provides him or her with valuable diagnostic information. The doctor will then examine you, and if they suspect adhesive capsulitis, they're gonna spend a fair amount of time uh, focusing on assessing your range of motion. They will likely obtain x-rays uh, to make sure that you don't have arthritis or evidence of a prior injury. MRIs are generally not necessary to make this diagnosis, but they may be helpful to look for other problems, especially when the presentation is not straightforward or textbook. The first question that patients often have after they are diagnosed is why? How or why did they get this disease? The bottom line is that nobody really knows. Now there are some trends about who gets adhesive capsulitis. For example, patients with diabetes get adhesive capsulitis more commonly, and they tend to get more severe cases than patients without diabetes. Likewise, there are a handful of other metabolic problems that may play a role, such as hypothyroidism, but none of these associations mean causation, and defining an exact cause has proven very difficult. You know, what is interesting is that a good number of patients relate the onset of symptoms to some sort of injury, usually a relatively trivial trauma, but it appears that the trauma thing is a classic red herring, meaning that in most cases the injury did not cause the adhesive capsulitis, although it may have been the first moment that you noticed the symptoms or maybe you made the symptoms worse. Now, adhesive capsulitis has classically been described as occurring in defined stages. Traditionally, the terms freezing, frozen, and thawing have been used, but, but, but defining the stage of disease is of little benefit in this context, beyond to mention that the last stage has been described as having spontaneous resolution of pain and stiffness, and that you may even get some return of range of motion. So this suggests that adhesive capsulitis has a life cycle that includes spontaneous resolution, which begs the question, does adhesive capsulitis need to be treated? And if you go back to Dr. Codman, who was the first to describe adhesive capsulitis, he counseled patients not to have any interventional treatment since he believed all symptoms slowly resolved. And as late as 1996, one author suggested observation since in his study, all 50 patients treated with heat and minimal home exercises experienced spontaneous resolution. The problem is that spontaneous resolution and return of range of motion in that study took almost four years. More importantly, more recent studies tell a slightly different story. One study reports that up to 60% of patients treated with observation alone had a persistent range of motion deficit. Now the discrepancy here is almost certainly explained in part by the fact that the way doctors measure outcomes has begun to change. There has been a trend in orthopedic liter literature towards the uh, inclusion of more patient-based outcome measures instead of just relying on doctor's objective findings. So it is clear in my mind that patients with adhesive capsulitis deserve more active care than simple observation. Now to, to treat adhesive cap capsulitis appropriately, you need to keep the nature of it in mind. 
in mind, it is first and foremost an inflammatory condition. The shoulder's joint capsule gets inflamed. Once inflamed, the capsule and the ligaments within shorten, causing tightness. Regarding treatment, I suggest that the treating physician focus on the inflammation first. Once the inflammation is addressed, then you can stretch out the capsule and recover the lost range of motion. Unfortunately, I see many patients in whom this approach is reversed, where initially the focus is on stretching out the persistently inflamed capsule. Since that capsule is inflamed, this early focus on regaining range of motion causes unnecessary pain. Candidly, very few people meet with success with early aggressive PT in isolation. So I start with addressing the inflammatory component first. Now there are two ways to do this. One way is, with, uh, is to take a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication such as Aleve, Ibuprofen, Voltaren, and, and there's a handful of others. The other way is with an injection of cortisone. Understanding the difference between these complementary approaches is facilitated by an analogy. If the inflammation within the shoulder is akin to a campfire, then the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory is a bucket of water and the injection is a fire extinguisher. Now, with consistent applications of small buckets of water over a period of weeks, that fire will be brought under control. However, it usually just takes one application of the fire extinguisher to get an effect. Dis now, discuss the relative merits of either uh, of both of these approaches with your physician or see the appropriate educational video on this YouTube channel for more information. Additionally, there are several complementary modalities that I would consider appropriate at this stage, such as acupuncture or massage. Now, if you're, uh, after your, your first visit and after initiating treatment, I will recommend an early return to the office for a follow-up visit. Now, it's usually within the first three weeks after that first office visit. During the time between these two office visits, I recommend uh, that you use your shoulder as normally as your symptoms will allow. Now, well-done literature suggests that there is no improvement in patient outcomes when one compares early aggressive attempts to regain range of motion versus more gentle approaches. So I suggest that you neither work your, heart, your shoulder too much, nor should you overprotect it. The goal should be to maintain the range of motion and function that you have without causing undue discomfort. When you return to the office, the question will be how much has your pain improved, although it will also be important to note any changes in your range of motion. So after assessing your improvement, we will discuss the relative merits of a gentle home-based approach consisting of passive range of motion exercises versus formal physical therapy. This decision can represent each patient's unique situation, but I find most patients uh, choose to start with home-based exercises at this point. And of course, formal physical therapy can always be considered at subsequent office visits. The vast majority of patients will enjoy complete pain relief and return of good range of motion and normal function with this approach. Unfortunately, there is a small group of patients that will require more invasive care. The surgical options include a manipulation under general anesthesia and an arthroscopic lysis of adhesions. A manipulation under anesthesia involves moving the patient's arm while they are anesthetized beyond the point of motion restriction. This movement breaks up or pulls apart the scar tissue. The arthroscopic surgery involves surgically cutting that same scar tissue. Now there is some debate in the orthopedic literature about which approach is best across all patients, but both approaches have been proven to be effective when applied in the, in the right setting. My approach involves customizing the treatment plan to each individual patient. The bottom line is if adequate range of motion is regained by simple manipulation, then there is no reason to subject the patient to the slightly increased risks of surgery. If, however, experience tells me that not enough range of motion has been regained by the simple manipulation, then the small surgical risks are outweighed by the risks of failure of treatment. Now, in these cases, in these few patients in whose range of motion is not easily regained by manipulation alone, I will proceed with the arthroscopic procedure because of this complex risk-benefit analysis. Now, both the, the manipulation and the arthroscopic procedure, they disrupt that thick mature, mature scar tissue that was limiting the patient's range of motion. Unfortunately, that scar tissue begins to heal back right after surgery, essentially reforming as new, young, thin scar tissue. So in effect, both procedures will trade thick, mature scar tissue that did not respond to physical therapy and home stretches for new, more malleable scar tissue that will be easier to push through with PT and home stretches. Therefore, it is very important for the post-op patient to aggressively move their arm right after surgery, even on the same day of surgery, 
to limit the extent of scar reformation. Similarly, formal physical therapy is usually arranged for shortly after surgery, maybe even the next day. Now with persistent effort, that new thin scar tissue will be overcome and your range of motion and function will improve. In conclusion, adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder is a very common condition. It can be mysterious to patients, but to experienced clinicians, it's pretty straightforward. The vast majority of patients do very well and never need aggressive invasive treatments, but even those that do need surgery often are ultimately very happy with their outcomes. Thank you for your time.